So this is an 82-year-old female without prior cardiac history, came in from, from another hospital, exertional, shortness of breath, resting precordial chest pain, risk factors, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, initial ECG, showed non specific ST T wave changes. She had initial troponin that was elevated. Physical examination, uh, not too impressive, except for she had some mild respiratory distress. She had JVP elevation. Her lungs, few we without wheezing, few crackles, extremities warm and dry, minimal edema, bilateral. This is her initial labs. You can see the elevated troponin. Hemoglobin was OK. ECG is shown here. You can see that she's got some uh, Q waves in V1, V2, V3, as well as uh, left axis deviation, some T wave inversions. Patient initially treated as ACS, improved her symptoms with general diuresis. Uh, she had an echocardiogram, because everyone has an echocardiogram. She had a normal EF. EF is 64%. She had some RV enlargement, some mild depression of RV function, normal PA pressures. And she went and had a regadenosin myocardial perfusion scan because it was suspected she had ACS and, and we wanted to see how much ischemia she had. Well, these are her scan results and you can see that basically she had a normal myocardial perfusion scan. The polar maps are normal. And if you look at her uh, wall motion, you can also see that it's hopefully, hopefully, you never know about these things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, doesn't seem to be working. Anyway, she had normal wall motion. OK, so she continued to have shortness of breath. She had intermittent wheezing. She had decreased O2 sats. And the wheezing could have been possibly due to that. Like, like, she, like I said, she has some mild peripheral edema. So based on all of this and her echo findings, she went ahead and had a lower extremity Doppler, which actually showed uh, a DVT involving the left popliteal vein. So now, because of that, it was like, well, she's had DVT. They continued with heparin. And they got a VQ scan, OK, because of the, they didn't, she didn't get a CT in this case because she had renal insufficiency. VQ scan results showed low probability. She had max, match defects in the right lower lobe. With PE probably ruled out, there was still concern about her elevated troponin. And actually, uh, my partner took care of this patient. And the whole idea was, could the spec study have been a false positive, you know, a false negative, rather? I mean, could she really have 83-year-old patient? You must have coronary disease. So she had a definitive study. So the definitive study was a CT. So you'll notice, first of all, that she has a marked elevation of her right hemidiaphragm. And uh, that's probably why she had a match defect on her VQ scan. And if you look at her coronaries, actually, they were pretty good, non-obstructive non coronary artery disease. Uh, so that confirmed the results of the stress MPI. I like to think that nuclear imaging is still pretty good. But she had a markedly elevated or markedly dilated pulmonary artery. And when I see this on a CT scan, I always start to worry. And so looking at this now, you can see that she had large emboli, OK, in both sides. So uh, multiple pulmonary emboli. And this was on heparin. And again, you can see emboli here and emboli here. And I want to emphasize that on our studies, we always gate the images. And it's very important to gate because you can see this is a non-gated study, how blurry. And yeah, the, in this very uh, you know, proximal uh, part of the pulmonary artery, you can see defects. But you can see much more clarity when you gate the images, even when you don't time the bolus to uh, the pulmonary artery. Now, like in this, the Hounsfield units were about 180 in the pulmonary artery and about 350 in the uh, aorta, because we were timing the study to the aorta to look at the coronary arteries. But we've commonly found a pulmonary emboli using a gating technique. So in terms of uh, how we look at pa patients, obviously we use different criteria. This is the Wells criteria. Now, it's kind of interesting. In our patient, she had only mild peripheral edema. She had none of these characteristics. So she would have been at most a three and low to intermediate risk, OK? Let's look at the issue of VQ scans. This is a typical VQ scan. This is a ventilation scan. This is a perfusion scan. You can see there's a perfusion ventilation match here, as shown here, when you look at the VQ quotient. And this patient had pneumonia. This patient actually had a PE with a VQ mismatch. So that's what we typically look for 
uh, when we do VQ scans. And this is a typical normal uh, VQ scan, and this is one with uh, segmental abnormalities consistent with abnormal perfusion. And if the ventilation had been normal, like seen here, this would be quite typical of what you would expect with a pulmonary embolus. The problem is that when you look at the likelihood of having a PE, it varies tremendously depending on whether you have a normal study uh, versus a low probability where it's less than 20%. Look at an intermediate study, 20 to 80% likelihood of having a PE. I mean, it's all over the lot. It's all over the lot. And if you have any kind of abnormality on the chest X-ray, you're, you're, you're out of luck because then it always becomes an intermediate study. And so if you have any kind of COPD, pneumonia, lung cancer, interstitial lung disease, lung compression, an elevated hemidiaphragm like we saw in our patient, you're stuck with a non-diagnostic study. So what does that really entail? So when you look at this, I looked at the PIOPED study and the value of VQ scanning. Again, this was in a large population, almost 1,000 patients. First of all, I want you to notice that reader agreement was greater than 90% if the study was normal or abnormal. But if it was intermediate, only 70% of people agreed with, if you look at radiologists or radiologists reading these things in terms of what would be intermediate. What you'll also notice is that high probability scans only represent a, a minority and near normal studies only represent a, a minority and most studies are in this intermediate uh, to, uh, to low risk category. And uh, the problem is when you look at uh, the intermediate group, which is 39%, and uh, you can see that as you go into sensitivity and specificity, if you just use high probability, then you miss about 60% of PEs. So if you incorporate everything, then you only miss 2%. But my goodness, you're also going to have a specificity that's terrible. Okay, so VQ scanning is not very helpful. And in fact, even in people with near normal scans, about 10% will still have a PE if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, digital subtraction angiography results. So this is a real problem in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And in fact, there are some algorithms you can use if you have to have a VQ scan. And really, I, the only way I can see that you'd really need a VQ scan is if, is if you had someone who had renal failure and was not on dialysis, where you really didn't want to give them contrast. But if you look at different studies that have been performed, most of the time you base it on uh, the likelihood. If it's PE unlikely, you do a D-dimer. If it's less than 500, you've basically excluded PE. If it's over 500, you get, the, you get a VQ scan. And you can see that based on that, if it's normal VQ and any clinical risk of PE, you're, you're probably going to be OK in terms of not needing tr therapy. If it's low risk uh, VQ scan, low probability, and it's a low risk patient, you're still probably OK. And if you're high risk and you have high probability, you're more likely than not going to have a PE. But the problem is anything else, you're kind of stuck in the dark. And that's that intermediate group, which represents, you know, 40% of the patients where you have a 20 to 80% likelihood of having PE. So you can see that it's not very good. Yet some people still profess that. And this, I always like this article, don't bury the VQ scan. It's as good as multi-detector CT, but is it really? I'll show you some data on that. And it's always talked about the less radiation dose. In terms of, particularly in young women, in terms of the breast, uh, it is true with VQ, you can get less than one milligray to the breast, but I'll show you with CT, you can get the same thing now. Now, let's look at CT. This is the PIOPED 2 study in terms of the value of CT. 824 patients suspected of, of PE who um, underwent a, a multi-detector CT. And the diagnosis of PE was kind of interesting because it actually used VQ scan results as a diagnostic criteria. That's kind of interesting in itself. So digital subtraction angiography only occurred in 27% of the patients. 30% were said to be uh, normal based on a, uh, either a, high prob a low probability or normal uh, VQ scan or a high probability VQ scan. That was 30% of patients. And then there was this, this match, this other kind of mixed group. If you had an abnormal Doppler and a non-diagnostic VQ scan, then that was considered still a PE, even though there was no evidence of PE just because of an abnormal Doppler. So there was all different uh, grades of how you might look at this. But if you look at the overall results, CT still did very well. Overall, 90% sensitivity. If you use CT plus uh, CT venography, uh, specificity very good, as well as if you just use CT alone. And in fact, if you look at the individual groups, you can see 
particularly in the high-risk group, the positive predictive value, high, intermediate and high risk, you get very high uh, positive predictive values. Not surprisingly, in the low clinical risk group, because there are so few patients, first of all, the positive predictive value goes, low, goes lower. So that's the one caveat. The negative predictive value also is lower in patients with high probability, but there are so few of those patients. There are so few of those patients. And you can see the strength of CT in the intermediate and, and uh, low probability groups in terms of very high uh, negative predictive value. This is the only study that has actually compared VQ to CT, and it did it in 1,400 patients with suspected uh, PE. And I want to just show you these results because the VQ scan, 35% had normal studies, but everyone in this study, they ended up getting uh, 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 lower extremity Dopplers anyway. And you can see that in this study, 1% uh, of those patients ended up having DVT anyway, even though they had a normal VQ scan. And in fact, at three months, still 1% of patients had venal thromboembolic events. In the non-diagnostic group, again, 54% had non-diagnostic scans, okay? And 7% had uh, subsequent VTEs by either uh, lower extremity Doppler or by CT and follow-up, and only 11% were abnormal. Compare that with CT, 80% had normal studies and a very, very low risk of DVT or events in the, in the subsequent three months, 0.4%, only 1.5% non-diagnostic studies, and 17% were abnormal. So an algorithm that you might think of, and, and I think uh, Eric talked a little bit about this, is the issue of using uh, dimer, D-dimers in CT as well. And this has been proposed by the uh, PIAPED investigators, saying if you have a low or intermediate risk patient, you get a D-dimer. If it's, if it's low, you're excluded. If not, you go to CT, et cetera. And you can get pretty good results in terms of uh, outcomes, and this is looking at three-month outcomes, except in those patients who are either inconclusive or where CT is not performed. In this study, uh, actually only 0.8% of patients had inconclusive CT scans. So it's very consistent with what I just showed you in PIOPED 2. And so CT becomes a very robust technique. The other thing about CT is you can pick up things that may also explain why someone has shortness of breath, not just PE. So in this study, 9% uh, uh, of patients had PE. This is almost 600 CTs reviewed specifically for PE. But a lot of patients had other things like pulmonary infiltrates, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, aortic aneurysms, hiatal hernias, all which could have explained the patient's symptoms. And in fact, also in this study, 23% of patients had new nodules, masses, or adenopathy that required additional follow-up. So you get a lot more with CT uh, in terms of other things, not just uh, the issue of finding PE or not. The other thing I want to emphasize is that nowadays we have these great new scanners, okay? So this is an old, this would be the speed of an old 64 slice scanner. This is our four scanner, and it's a dual source. And you can see how fast the temporal resolution is so fast on these systems, plus the speed at which the gantries move. This is how an old standard helical scan works. Look at the speed of this particular system in terms of getting a, this is what we call the flash mode, okay? So it's extremely rapid in terms of how we can get data. And what that means is that we can get data using just small little intervals of the R wave. And that freeze frames our images very nicely so we can get really crisp images. And this is not a PE patient, but this is just showing you a patient who had atrial fibrillation where the heart rate ranged anywhere from, from 54 up to 140. And yet you can see this stent absolutely beautiful using just very selective portions of the, of the QRS complex. And so you get motionless images, even at fast heart rates. And of course, as I said, with PE, you really also want to do that. You want to get very, very uh, crisp images and, uh, and be able to do that motionless and gate those images and get good pictures. So this is an example of a patient. Uh, you can see the heart rate, et cetera. This patient, the whole scan only was half of a millisievert half of a millisievert, and extremely diagnostic images. And this is a paper that just uh, recently came out using this flash kind of mode that we use that's very rapid. And you know, I talked about VQ in terms of the issue of radiation. Well, look at what you can get with a flash image. I already showed that one patient was 0.6 millisieverts. In this, in this phantom model where they estimated, the average dose was about one millisievert uh, at 100 kV and 1.8 millisieverts at 120 kV, and when you look at the breast uh, exposure, it was only 0.07 millisieverts, so extremely low radiation. So the idea of using VQ because you have a young patient and you're worried about breasts 
uh, radiation is, is gone as long as you have state-of-the-art equipment like we do here. We also have lower extremity Doppler. I just want to emphasize, as I showed you, the lower extremity Doppler is used in conjunction with VQ scanning in patients that have indeterminate uh, uh, ex exams. Uh, obviously, that diagnoses DVT. It does not diagnose PE. Okay? And most people with PE actually don't have evidence of DVT on examination. We can also use echocardiography. I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar, especially in patients with acute um, uh, abnormalities, acute shortness of breath, et cetera, where they're hemodynamically unstable. You can see RV dilation, as you see here. But you can also see that, see that on other um, kinds of uh, studies. This is a patient who we had a couple of years ago, uh, maybe about two years ago, a 62-year-old fellow, came in with classic symptoms of angina. And uh, he had a nuclear study because of that. And you can see normal perfusion. And uh, if you look at the, uh, at the gating, I don't know if, you, if this will even work. It, uh, by George, some things do work. OK, so you can see that actually his RV was dilated, and uh, it was hypokinetic, OK? His overall LV function was normal, but this RV was clearly hypokinetic. So I called up the physician. I said, you know, this ventricle, this RV is dilated. It's hypokinetic. The RV is not thick. I said, you really need to consider PE in this guy. So they got a CT on him. And uh, I'll show you that. See if I can get to the next slide. Here we go. So he had a CT, as was the nuclear study, which showed you had a normal CT uh, in terms of his coronaries, a little myocardial bridge that's nothing. But look at the uh, CT scan. Big pulmonary emboli all over the place. OK? So and again, this is time to the aorta. This is. You can see the pulmonary artery here is a little bit, is about the same as the aorta here. And actually what we did here is we gave a 50-50 uh, mixture on the flush of contrast and saline. So we would get a little bit more contrast in the pulmonary artery. But you can see how robust uh, CT is in terms of being able to do that. So this is the 2015 uh, appropriate use criteria. This is a committee I was actually on in terms of deciding what should be what. And this is uh, done by the uh, ACR. And uh, this is in D-dimer negative patients uh, who are no, not, low, not high likelihood. You see, none of our techniques are really warranted, right? None of them are warranted. In people who are D-dimer positive, you can see that basically uh, C, uh, uh, CT and VQ get appropriate ratings, and uh, the rest of these tests do not. In patients that have a very high likelihood, uh, CT and uh, VQ again do that, and in pregnancy, uh, CT, if patients have leg symptoms, maybe CTA, uh, compression uh, Doppler because um, uh, lower extremity Doppler because it doesn't have radiation. Patients with no leg symptoms, uh, both are considered appropriate. Uh, as you can see here, both, um, uh, both uh, CT as well as, uh, as well as VQ. So you can see there's a lot of ways you can skin a cat, but the bottom line is that CT, according to most studies in terms of what I've showed you so far today, is preferable to VQ scanning as the first line test after a D-dimer, for instance, in a low to intermediate risk patient, and first line in a high risk patient, because it's convenient, it's fast, there are few equivocal results, there's high inter and observer inter and intra-observer reproducibility, similar radiation exposure uh, using state-of-the-art equipment, and really, the only place for a VQ scan in my mind today is in patients with renal insufficiency who you don't want to give contrast, like in the patient I showed you initially as our first case, who ultimately her renal failure improved, and we got a CT and made the diagnosis. Thank you very much.